there are a lot of things to consider for people who are interested in sustainability. But one of the non-negotiables is that it can't use animals. And right. so the, the footprint of, of animal agriculture is just too high. Uh, yeah. Even pastoral systems, which certainly are preferable to the factory farms, use up so much land that if we were going to shift toward only those type of pastoral systems, you would have to deforest the, a huge portion of the planet to make room for all of, of that production. Mm -hmm. And so we simply have to reduce the number of animals who are being used. So there are other factors that are really important to consider, like sustainable packaging and uh, what type of energy or uh, production facilities are using. However, the real key, the bottom line is that just in the same way, that we really need to move away from fossil fuels as a civilization. We have to move away from the exploitation of animals for food. And that is what companies like the Better Meat Co are trying to do, as well as many others in the space too. And it's going to take a lot of companies to accomplish this. Hi Paul, good morning, how are you? Well, nice to see you, how are you? All well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining in. My pleasure. Great to be talking with you. Awesome. Great. Hi, viewers. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the new episode of Sustainable Future Food Stock. Today, we have with us Paul Shapiro from the United States. Paul is the author of the national bestseller, Clean Meat, How Growing Meat uh, Without Animals Will Revolutionize uh, Dinner and the World. The CEO of the Better Meat Company, a four-time TEDx speaker, and the host of the Business for Good podcast. So, uh, Paul, uh, really appreciate your time this morning. Uh, I could see your sweatshirt and it's written the Better Meat Company. So, if you can uh, give a brief background about the Better Meat Company and we'll, we'll take it forward from there. Sure, Noel. Well, so, if you think about the fact that the planet is just not getting any bigger, but then we recognize that humanity's footprint on the planet is getting bigger. We have more and more people coming onto the planet and we have... Uh, on a per person basis, people are really uh, consuming a lot more. And so, and so you got to do something, right? So we know that a principal uh, way that we leave our footprint is through our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. Just takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions to raise and slaughter billions and billions of animals for food. And it would be wonderful if people were happy just to eat rice and dal or if they were happy to eat rice and beans, or if they were happy to eat hummus or lentil soup uh, or chana masala, that would be great. I'd be overjoyed. However, people want to eat meat and meat consumption is going up, not down. It's yeah. going up in the United States. It's going up in India. It's going up in China, up in Brazil, and all the places where in the future it is going to matter the most, meat consumption on a per person basis is going up, not down. And so the question is, can we create meat experiences that satiate people without the need to raise and slaughter animals. And that's what we at the Better Meat Co. are trying to do in the same way that we need to create energy without fossil fuels. So we need solar and wind and geothermal and more. We need to create meat experiences that are divorced from animal slaughter so that we can not just prevent animal cruelty, though that is important in and of itself, but also feed humanity sustainably without destroying the planet in the process. Okay. Okay. Interesting. That, that's lovely. So, uh, you know, uh, since you have an extensive experience in the CPG industry in the US, so if you can please suggest a few tips for the emerging brands to identify that right target audience or, you know, how do we define the customer, define the customer in the natural food space? Sure. So it, it used to be that alternative meats are sometimes called plant-based meats yeah. were really the domain of vegetarians. And so for a long time, you had companies like Light Life and Tofurky and others in like the 1980s and 90s, and they were really trying to appeal to vegetarians. And so they were creating foods that were kind of meat-like, but not identical. They weren't fooling anybody into thinking that they were actual meat. Mm -hmm. And then starting around uh, five to 10 years ago, you started having companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods who are trying to replicate the entire meat experience. And so they were going after not just vegetarians and vegans, 
but also meat consumers who want to eat meat. They want the experience of meat, but they don't want uh, to, they, they would love to have it even if it didn't include animal slaughter. And so those people are not vegetarians, but they're sometimes called flexitarians or meat reducers. And this is the real audience that nearly the entirety of our space is now going after because the percentage of people, at least in the United States, who are vegetarian is very small. The percentage yeah. of people who would be happy to eat fewer animals is very high. And so there's a much bigger market for people who simply want to cut back on their meat consumption, whether for health or environmental or animal welfare reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are people who say, I literally am never going to eat meat. And so there's been a shift in this industry away from appealing to vegetarians and toward appealing to these so-called flexitarians. Yes, interesting. So a uh, question on this, Paul. So, I mean, since you have spent a lot of time in the U.S. market, so how do you see the new consumer trends in the, in the North American uh, mainstream market? Well, in the past uh, several years, it was really all about burgers, right? So there's like basically these plant-based burger wars. And everybody was trying to replace the burger. Now you have a lot more emphasis on things like fish and chicken and turkey and pork and even whole muscle cuts. And so if you look at the plant-based market today, nearly all of it is ground meat. It's people who are making plant-based meatballs and sausages and fish sticks and chicken nuggets. Whereas now you do see more of an effort to create a whole muscle mimicry. So steaks, chicken breasts, fish fillets and more yeah okay okay great so uh, you know coming down to my next question uh, sustainability is an important element in the coming time and you also at the better meat co are also aggressively working towards it so what are those non negotiables for an emerging cpg brand to consider on the sustainability front there are a lot of things to consider for people who are interested in sustainability but one of the non negotiables is that it can't use animals. And right. so the, the footprint of, of animal agriculture is just too high. Uh, yes. Even pastoral systems, which certainly are preferable to the factory farms, use up so much land that if we were going to shift toward only those type of pastoral systems, you would have to deforest the, the huge portion of the planet to make room for all of, of that production. Mm -hmm. And so we simply have to reduce the number of animals who are being used. So there are other factors that are really important to consider, like sustainable packaging and uh, what type of energy or uh, production facilities are you using. However, the real key, the bottom line is that just in the same way that we really need to move away from fossil fuels as a civilization, we have to move away from the exploitation of animals for food. And that is what companies like the Better Meat Co are trying to do, as well as many others in the space too. And it's going to take a lot of companies to accomplish this. Lovely. So uh, Paul, you, you have been running, uh, successfully running Impact the Better Meat Co for uh, more than four years now. So if you can throw some light on how you as an entrepreneur have grown the brand and uh, in the CPG space, how can you, you know, uh, really inspire entrepreneurs? Well, one of the key things that I always recommend is simply to start. There's so many people out there who, who don't, who they become paralyzed because they think, ah, I don't have the education. I don't have the experience. You know, like I need to go to school or whatever they think before starting their company. When if you look at the actual, uh, many of the most successful companies, they were started by people who had even less experience than the listener of this show probably does. So as an example, you know, take um, a company called Perfect Day. They were founded by uh, two Indian Americans, Ryan Pandya and Paramal Gandhi. And these guys were in their very early 20s, probably around 21, 22 years old. They had never met each other in person. Mm -hmm. They had gone, they, they had both um, just finished college and they met up by a, a video chat because they were introduced by a fellow friend. Okay. And they decided by video chatting, they both had this idea that they thought was a cool idea to try to create milk proteins without animals. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that they thought, okay, well, let's start a company together. Now, neither one of them had entrepreneurial experience. They didn't have venture capital experience. They weren't PhDs in any field. Like they were just two college graduates who thought this will, uh, this will work. 
And lo and behold, you fast forward to less than a decade later, and these guys are now in their late 20s, and they have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for their company. They have a, the Perfect Day brand now has a valuation of $1.5 billion, wow. and they're still going. And so you look at that, and that's just one, that's just one example yeah. of people who took the initiative to just start. And so that's my main recommendation. So many times when we don't do things, we place mental shackles on ourselves, and we think, uh, I can't do that. That's for somebody else to do. And we are the barrier for our own advancement. And so I highly recommend that if you have an idea and you think that you want to start a company, just go out and try it. You know, the way that people learn how to play soccer, for example, isn't by reading books about playing soccer. They get out on the field and they start practicing. And they go. That's the same. You know, if you think that you have an idea, get out on the field and start playing. See how it goes. And I promise you, whether you succeed or whether you fail, you will not regret trying. Yes, I love it. I love it. This is such an interesting example. I'm sure, I mean, you know, uh, this will be really uh, super useful for the aspiring entrepreneurs who are, you know, uh, who are uh, stuck by the mental barrier of not starting up. So I'm sure this will be super useful for them. Thank you so much for this. Great. So uh, coming down to my last question for this session, uh, Paul, uh, what are those important aspects for a natural CPG brand to consider while designing its uh, marketing and branding strategies? Well, I, I think there's so many of them to all, but I'll tell you, one of the key things <clears throat> that I think is really important is to differentiate between what your motivation is and what actually appeals to your customers, because you may be highly motivated, let's say to help animals or to save the planet. But what we found is that those are not the most motivating factors for people who are buying plant-based meats and other plant-based products. Many of them are buying them because they want to feel better. They want to look better. They want to be healthier. Maybe they just like the taste. And so while uh, somebody like myself is highly motivated by a passion to help animals and the planet, it's not necessarily what you want to go out and advertise on because there's a very limited number of people who that is going to be their driving factor. So if you look at the marketing campaigns of some of the most successful companies in the space, like Beyond Meat, they primarily talk about the taste of their products. They're not mm -hmm. so much talking about how you're going to save animals by buying their products. And so right. it's, it's, we, we need to just differentiate between what is appealing to us and what's our motivation for starting a company and what's actually going to make people go out and buy your product. That's such a simple point, but you know, a lot of organizations uh, maybe make it complicated to uh, you know, target the audience, but this is such a simple point which should be considered. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Cool. Perfect. Thank you so much, Paul. I mean, uh, the kind of responses which you gave uh, are super useful. And, uh, you know, this is really inspiring for the entrepreneurs out there. And uh, thank you so much once again for, for such incredible insights. Thank you so much. It's really nice to talk. It's great to talk with you, Duval. I'm giving you a fist bump from California. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, I, I hope, I very much hope that we get to cross paths in person sometime. Absolutely. Looking forward. Looking forward. Thank you so much. And uh, you have a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.